So in class, we went through this little ranking scenario, trying to guess which took the longest to the ground, had the greatest range, the highest ap apogee, and the fastest speed to the ground. And let me just display some values. We know for the dropping ball, we calculated this on a previous lab. We did a 1D motion. And then for 2D motion, we figured out that the ball lands 0.904 meters away from where it started. That's its range. And it's x velocity to the ground is 2 meters per second. We have a constant x velocity because there's no forces acting in the x direction. And our y velocity increases to negative 4.43 meters per second. So it's going at quite a quick speed when it's hitting the ground. It has an x component and a y component. Um, and the question was, how do we figure out exactly what happens with C and D? We can make some pretty good guesses on some of these, like the longest time to the ground and the highest apogee and the fastest speed at the ground, but the greatest range is a difficult guess to make. So the question is, is how to solve for parts C and D? And we've already looked at part B using 2D motion with our 2D motion lab, and we found by splitting the X motion and the Y motion into two pieces and looking at them separately, we were able to put them back together to figure out where the ball was. For parts C and D, same we can apply the same methodology. Um, I will go through the five-step process with you, and you'll see we used the same five-step process before with 1D, and it's, it's virtually identical. Um, all we need to do is add one step. If we have any vectors that are in two dimensions, they have both an X and a Y component, well, just let's, let's break them down into the two pieces. And as you recall, to do that, what we did is we drew some horizontal lines on either end of the vectors and drew some vertical lines, and then we were able to piece in what the left and right components and up and down components were for each one of these situations, as you can see I'm doing in each one of these diagrams here. We'll do some more practice on that later. And what we're left with is instead of a one 2D vector, we have two one-dimensional vectors that we can use for our initial conditions. So our five-step process is identical to before, and you'll notice the one line that comes in here when we're putting together our data, if we have a a two-dimensional vector in there, the one that has that's not moving left and right or up and down at some combination, well, we'll just break it down into its x and y pieces. So let's apply the five-step process to scenario C. The first thing we're going to do is we need to draw a physics diagram, and this is already a pretty simple diagram, so let's start with this, what we're given. So we're given ball C is on a 45-degree ramp, and it has a 2 meter per second velocity. Um, let's go ahead. The first thing we should do in our diagram is we're going to put x, y axes in. And that will also draw in a approximation of what we expect the path to be. And so there's our expected path. And we're looking for when it lands on the ground is one of the key points. But we're also um, interested in where the apogee is of this. So we'll just draw those in because we'll know we'll be solving for those later. And from our selection of the y-axis right through the object, we get to pick our x naught equals zero meters. It's going to be helpful to knock out any things we can on an equation with zeros. And we also know that our initial height is one meter, so that's our y naught. Um, and now we have to apply this new rule. We have a velocity vector that has some x and some y, so we're going to have to break that up into its pieces. So the easiest way to do this to start with is to draw some horizontal lines at either end of the arrow and some vertical lines on either end of the arrow. And so there's our x components are somewhere along there and our y components are somewhere along there. And then we can just take a look at this. We know this arrow is moving up and to the right. And as you, I've said that down here, up and to the right. The up portion is going to be our y piece and the right portion is going to be our x piece. And so here's our rightward piece and here's our upward piece those two pieces together are equivalent to the purple vector. All right, so there's our decomposition. Now, if we only knew what lengths those were, we could fill out these blocks. Well, the nice thing is, to start with, we're going to use some special right triangles. X and Y axes are form a right angle right here, so we have a 45-45 right triangle. And as you know, if we have our hypotenuse is X, uh, is, I'm sorry, X squared of 2, and our two sides are x and x. Or we could also say our hypotenuse is x, and our two sides are x over the square root of 2 and x over the square root of 2. So using that, we can simply take our 2 meters per second here and divide by the square root of 2 on both of our sides and come up with 1.41 meters per second for vy naught and the same thing for vx naught. 
and sorry, this should be this should read a 1.41 over here. And to get our accelerations, we've got to look at what's causing the acceleration. Remember, forces cause acceleration. So what forces are acting on this object as it's flying through the air? We're not going at a high speed. It's flying through the air. Nothing's touching it. The only thing that's acting on it is gravity, and that's our free fall assumption. And you need to explain that a bit, as I did here. So the only force acting on it is gravity, and that's straight downward. That gives us our downward acceleration. And our acceleration of the x, there are no forces acting in the x direction if we assume there are no other forces like a rocket motor or air resistance. And so we'll have nothing in the x direction and negative 9.8 due to gravity in the y direction. Simple as that. Now, last thing we need to do then is we need to figure out what we want to find out about points or points of interest 1 and 2. We know something about these points and we should list that out. So at point of interest number 1, when it reaches the ground, we know the height is 0. All right, easy thing to remember. Remember, the velocity is not 0 because we're not actually touching the ground yet. The height is 0. And that's our y value that we know. And we're going to find time, x, and velocity. At the apogee, of course, what happens at the apogee? Think of an object flying in the air. You guys are shouting out apogee. Well, the, the y velocity is, goes to 0. So it stops moving upward. It still moves to the right. So we still have a, remember, our, our vx naught stays at 1.41 meters per second to the right continuously here. And so it's moving to the right always, but its upward motion stops momentarily. And that's, that's our key piece of information we'll use to solve this problem in the next step. All right, next step, step four. What are relationships apply? We need equations. And this is a constant acceleration situation. So we can use my favorite equations, five and six, because they'll solve any of these constant acceleration problems. But we're gonna, instead of using one set of equations, we'll do it twice, once for the x direction, once for the y. So we're going to write down our equations. We'll plug in our initial conditions only to start with and simplify a little bit. And there's my x, my position as a function of time in the x direction. Same thing for the velocity in the x direction. Uh, plug in our initial conditions. And you'll notice for our velocity in the x direction, there is no time value here because it is not dependent on time. It is constant at 1.41 meters per second. It does not change in the x direction. No force is acting in the x direction. So that velocity won't change. Same thing in the y direction. We'll plug in our initial values for our initial acceleration, our velocity, and our position. Plug those in. Simplify a bit. And there's our position as a function of time. Similarly, for the y direction, for the velocity in the y direction, we can come up with a, a velocity in the y direction equation. Now we can use these equations. We've got these equations. These tell us everything about the ball's position and its velocity in both the x and y direction for any future time. And now we can start plugging into these. We can either plug times in, positions in, or velocities in, and we can solve. So we know for point one, point of interest one, we know that that's the, at the ground, that's the point at the ground, we know that the height is zero. So there's only one spot that this y equals zero can fit. It fits right here. There is no other y1 over here. So we're going to plug a zero into that equation. And here's my equation. Just wrote it down. I substituted my zero in on the left side because the height is zero. Now we can use quadratic equation, and I won't go through the math. You guys know this. You've been quizzed on it. Plug this into the quadratic equation. I get two answers. I'm going to reject the negative. I'm going to keep the positive answer. So it takes 0.618 seconds to reach the ground. We had guessed before that this one was going to be the longest in the air. And remember, the, both A and B drop to the ground in 0.452 seconds. So this is quite a bit longer. This is about 20% longer. Now we can use that time. We can plug it into any other equation that has time in it. So we could plug it, here's a time value. We could plug it into x1. Here's time. We could plug it into, into y1. If we plugged it back into vy1, we'd find out. Um, actually, if we plugged it into y1, we've plugged that time in. We'd just get 0 meters, because we already used this equation to figure out that this was 0 meters. Plugging it into this equation, our time, we're going to get our velocity in the y direction. So let's do that. So let's plug into equation 5 first. And there's our position. That's our range. We call that our range. That's how far the ball moved to the right. 87 centimeters. A little bit less than our 2 meter per second horizontal ball. So this uh, looks like ball B won the range contest so far. And our velocity, downward velocity, we'll calculate that, and it's negative 4.65 meters per second. So those are our final answers. Um, let's take a look at the second 
question, what about the apogee? Well, at the apogee, we know that our velocity, upward velocity, drops to zero at the apogee, then, then turns around and starts moving back downward. So we're going to plug zero into the only place it fits. This is a velocity, and we, here's our velocity. We're going to plug it right into here. So we're going to plug it zero. So there's our equation. We'll plug a zero in. Solve for t. Just subtract the 1.41 over to the left, and then divide out the negative 9.8, and you get 0 0.144 seconds. So after only 0.14 seconds, we reach the apogee. So where is that apogee? Well, take that time, plug it into both our x and our y, and we have our answers. So here's the x value. After 20 centimeters to the right, it's, we're at our apogee, and we can calculate the height of that apogee is 1.10 meters. So it only moved upward about 10 centimeters um, before it uh, reached the apogee. So those are our answers for parts 1 and 2. So let's just take a look at our ranking scenarios again. So now we can add our item C in here. So as you can see, we, this is a longer time to the ground. We predicted that. This was something we didn't know. We couldn't really guesstimate. It was going to be close. We knew it was between B and C. Well, it looks like C uh, beat out B, but we had to do the math to figure it out. Our velocity to the ground, you'll notice that we have a 2 meter per second velocity, x velocity here that remains constant when it hits the ground. In the same sense here, the x component of this 2 meter per second at 45 degrees was 1.41. It stays the same all the way through its flight in the air. And at the ground, this one is moving at negative 4.65 meters per second. A um, little bit faster than this guy. Well, here's a question for you. This one's moving 2 meters per second in the x and negative 4.43 meters per second at the y. This one's moving a little bit slower in the x, but a little bit faster in the y. So which one of these is faster overall? That's a good question to figure out. Two bonus points for anybody who can tell me how to figure that out. And finally, here's our apogee. Our apogee, we found, is it moves upward uh, to the right 0.2 meters and upward 0.1 meters to find our apogee.